All right. Well, there, I think there are still some people uh, arriving, um, but we'll get started because we do only have the, the lunch hour together today. Um, so thank you all for uh, joining us. Uh, my name is Tyler Sherrard. I'm the um, executive director and gallery director um, for the Friends of University Hospitals and McMullen Gallery. Um, we're so grateful that you have all chosen to be here with us today. We are still very much at mercy of COVID-19 restrictions because our gallery is in an acute care hospital. So um, it is wonder wonderful to gather with so many of you virtually. Um, we at McMullen Gallery are tuning in from Treaty 6 territory. Um, the land on which the University of Alberta hospitals are located is home to Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoda, Tsutina, Dene, and other Indigenous peoples, and was so long before the hospital was built. I want to acknowledge that the arts have always formed an intrinsic part of communal culture of Indigenous people, and considering the work we do here, using the arts to heal communities of people, we align ourselves with generations of Indigenous knowledge. At McMullen Gallery, we hope that every patient who accesses this hospital will be able to feel understood or safe because of one of our programs and that people feel safe ac accessing all of our spaces. Um, if you feel compelled to share about the land where you are tuning in from, um, please feel free to do so in the chat. Um, we have uh, at McMullen Gallery had the pleasure of working with artist Marnie Blair to build and share her exhibition, Nervous Systems, which only has a few more days left at the gallery. Can't believe it is almost December. Um, the gallery or the, the exhibition has had an amazing uh, response from patients and staff so far. Um, lots, of, lots of great comments about the, the subject matter in the show and how it relates to the, the work and the experience of the people that are using the hosp hospital facility. Um, Marnie Blair is an artist, patient, and educator. Her work is informed by her experience of surviving cardiac arrest and having long QT syndrome, a condition that affects the heart's electrical system. We are also excited that Dr. Leanne McTavish will join Marnie in discussion today. Leanne is professor of the history of art, design, and visual culture in the Department of Art and Design at the University of Alberta. She offers courses in early modern visual culture and critical museum theory. Um, I'm going to try to get their full bios into the chat if you want to read a little bit more about the two of them as the conversation goes on. Um, just some housekeeping. You've probably noticed that we are recording today's presentation um, so that we can share it for folks later who couldn't attend today. Um, and we will not likely not have time for questions because we are only going for the lunch hour today. Um, however, if there is time, it will be at the end. So hold everything until then if, if questions are to happen. Um, so without further ado, I will pass things over to Marnie to tell us a little bit more about the exhibition itself before we get into the discussion. Thanks, Tyler. Um, and thanks, Leanne, and thanks to everybody for joining us today during their lunch hour. Uh, so my intro is, is pretty, pretty quick, um, but so there's a view of nervous systems and it's a, the, the exhibition is a combination of watercolor, photography, etchings, and painted woodcuts uh, that all explore the human body, uh, primarily the female body, through the lens of medicine, science, and technology. I reference early modern uh, medical imagery and I collaborate with a machine to create the work. Um, some of the pieces are interactive where the audience can engage or perform with the piece, uh, um, which includes touch and movement. Um, so that's just sort of a quick, a quick intro to the work. Okay, we can start our discussion then. Sure. Uh, Marnie, thank you so much for this work. I saw it at the McMullen Gallery. I absolutely loved it. So I was very lucky to get to experience it. And I had many questions about it. And I wondered what inspires your interest in the early modern body? Can you say more about 
how you came to learn about representations of the body in Europe between 1550 and 1750, and what is so intriguing about the medical imagery from this period. Right. Um, okay, so I first became interested in the body in 1999. Tyler mentioned I'm a cardiac arrest survivor. Um, so I was having my first defibrillator implanted and uh, the notion of having fibrous tissue uh, envelope the medical device they were putting in, especially the leads that go from the defibrillator to the heart. Um, scar tissue sort of grows around the leads and they don't come out. So this notice, notion of um, uh, the body and having, some, having it opened, something inserted and closed back up or the reverse um, became really interesting and important to me. Um, sort of, and it sort of reminds me of the game of operation. Um, so I did experience a defibrillator shock really early on and um, it was really alarming. And so uh, the idea of having sort of uh, a, uh, the, a medical device in your body or a foreign object in your body was really interesting. And so that is what inspired me to, I'm a printmaker, um, so I'm really interested in paper engineering. So I started uh, to look at early modern uh, notions of medical illustration um, for inspiration and for research purposes. Um, the reason for early modern is sort of we have, right, so we have uh, folks like Aristotle and Galen um, looking at the anatomy, but then we have um, some, and we'll talk a little bit later maybe about Vesalius, uh, but we have Vesalius doing um, uh, observational science and focusing on human dissection um, and looking at comparative anatomy um, and looking at the object, but the body as an object of um, scientific curiosity. Um, and so I became really interested in uh, the, the function and use of early modern flap anatomy. So we have an example here uh, of early modern flap anatomy that I was looking at at Duke University. And so it's not just the imagery, but it's the notion of who's using it, what are they using it for, um, and how it functions and maybe creates culture as a whole. Um, and also thinking about the notion of, a, of gendered or non-gendered anatomy. Right. right. It's great to see these examples. And um, I, you've already started to talk about sort of your interest in your research, but can you say more about how you actually make the works, how you made the works that are in the exhibition at the McMillan Gallery? Can you describe the decisions you made, the techniques used, the combination of materials that's quite fascinating in the exhibition? Sure. Um, okay. This one? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, my practice is very much about incorporating analog, digital, and analog processes. I want uh, to start in an analog or handmade, handmade mode of making, um, use technology, and then I want, a, I want an analog or handmade output. Um, it's important for me to have like a physical piece that someone can look at or touch or interact with. Um, so... I consider the watercolors and the photography in the show as research pieces for the painted woodcuts and the, and the etchings. Uh, so this is an image of, um, so the previous slide showed how I was hand drawing imagery um, inspired by early modern flap anatomy. And then what I do is I put the, the drawings into um, software and it creates a tool path for this, um, computer controlled machine or a CNC router to output my information. And one of the images is an etching. And the other, this image is the techno CNC router creating uh, a woodcut. And so the image on the left is the tool path of uh, a vagina. And so that would have been a small piece carved at about uh, one by two feet. And, um, so while I'm interest, interested in paper engineering, I was also interested in um, how, um, I'm interested in multiples, but I'm also interested in how can I incorporate a machine as a decision-making tool for my work uh, to like mimic or talk about how I rely on my defibrillator um, 
to control my electrical rhythms. So that notion of rely, the reliance uh, on the machine and sort of giving up a little bit of uh, the decision-making process mm -hmm. is the reason why I, I use technology and not just the handmade. Um, right, so the work is all carved, mostly all carved by CNC and whatever it outputs, I can then um, work into again, whether it's paint or watercolor or cutting and pasting. So this is just an example, if you're not um, familiar with woodcut printmaking. So um, here's just an example of a woodcut on the printmaking press, and I'm just inking and printing prints in a traditional manner. Um, but the the carvings are made using the CNC router. I was really struck by your focus on touch. You know, when I was experiencing the work that you can actually touch it, you can move it, the flaps, and that's really in keeping with early modern understandings of knowledge. So I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, can you say more about this focus on touch and the purpose of the interaction? Um, with the body, both in the present and the past. Right. Uh, okay, so here's an early piece on the left, and this is my seven-year-old interacting with the piece. Um, and on the right is uh, an etching, an etching I created um, with nine movable movable flaps. And I encourage, I take, I don't put glass on my pieces and I encourage the viewer to look through them. So why touch? Um, I think that, so we have x-ray and we have sonograms and CT scans and MRIs that let us peek inside the body, but I, they're sort of modern day descendants of flap anatomy. Um, and I think if you ask a nursing or a medical student about their own experiences learning anatomy, you'll hear just as much about those plastic layered mm -hmm. anatomy as you will as the, as the computer animations. Um, and I, and I think that for me, the, the movable parts are where it's really important, um, as a, as a visual aid or simulating the process of, um, of, of performing an anatomical dissection. I think these works are performative. Um, this piece in particular is performative. You're performing. Uh, a dissection or an autopsy and you're making the audience or the viewer is making decisions. And I think that um, that aspect is what's so important to me because it is uh, sort of the uh, where early modern flap anatomy was coming from. Um, yeah. I, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I am still interested in paper engineering. And so this is just, this is an example of making an addition. So um, I am interested in making additions of prints, just like um, some of these, uh, the, the early modern flap anatomy um, would have, they would have made copies and the printer or the publisher may have, may be cutting and pasting them into, into books. And so um, I'm performing this act. I'm interested in, so we have things like the bottom left-hand corner, the lacrimal that would turn blood into milk. Um, we have, and then we have on the top right, the little pieces uh, are little defibrillators that I can, right on the other, your other right. Little defibrillators that you can, um, that I Im input into my own uh, body. Um, and with the CNC router, I can input imagery and the router can carve it, recarve it, and I can sort of move it around to where I want so that I can uh, sort of collage with the machine, um, which is an, uh, sort of an interesting way to work. Uh, so I have an example of, oh, maybe, and this so I have an example in the exhibition of an unpainted, uncut. Uh, what we call a fugitive sheet uh, or uh, a, sh a single sheet that someone in the 1500s could paint, cut out and assemble themselves in themselves as an as an anatomical aid. 
Right. That's so great that how you're using early modern techniques, like the cutting and pasting that would have been done by printmakers, by the, the publishers, uh, but also you're asking the visitors to like touch and move and ex learn about the body that way, which is also very much in keeping with early modern practices, including that of Vesalius, right, who was really focused on touching um, to learn and not just looking. Uh, so I was really interested in your um, references to Vesalius, this Flemish um, anatomist who was first publishing his work in 1543. And I wondered if you could uh, talk more about Vesalius, your focus on the female body, say more about how Vesalius had access to bodies to dissect. Right. Okay. Uh, so the image on the left is Vesalius. Um, so I'm just, uh, I'm at the University of Min uh, Minnesota, um, sort of measuring the plate um, as research so that I can go back into the studio and recreate it. And uh, the image in the middle is my own sort of invented piece. Um, and so I'm, uh, it's funny, uh, it's, a, it's an engraving on the top and an etching on the bottom, just because the machine is a little off balance. Um, my Z axis is a little, a little wonky. But uh, if we look at early, uh, other early flap anatomy pieces like Remlin, there is a lot of sort of incidental doodling and mark making within the plate in the empty spaces. So this mm -hmm. is me inserting, inserting I'm thinking about COVID probably I'm thinking about the past year so I have uh yeah I have some COVID tests a six-pack ring a lot of bread um yeah uh uh anatom uh, forceps forceps that I saw in the collection at the Wangenstein um a sanitary sponge and uh quite a few coat hangers um, I, I feel like every time I go and do research in the States, uh, Roe versus Wade um, is, uh, is, happens to be something that they're voting on uh, every time I go down there. Um, on the right is an image of the piece cut and partially assembled. And with that, the little bit of a, like marginality or it might, the extra pieces, you can decide what you're going to do with those um, on the bottom. Um, right. So, uh, this is, is this, I think this is the infamous figure 20, uh, 25, 27 from Vesalius. And it's been repeated many times by many artists. Um, so I've sort of monumentalized it. It's as big as I can make it on the CNC router. And this isn't really, this isn't like Vesalius's invention. So he's informed by an earlier, uh, anatomist and publisher and printmaker. Um, and he's sort of following their instructions on how to create a vagina. Um, but so we're looking at uh, uh, like a one sex model of a vagina simply uh, being an inverted penis. Um, but I like to think of uh, a vagina and penis could be, they could be, a, they can exist simultaneously when I'm looking at this. Um, they're, it's flanked by speculums. I don't know if we need to get into the history of the spe speculum today, um, but it sort of has a sordid past um, with uh, the person who invented it. Um, but maybe this is a good time to talk about cadaver sourcing. And I, so I'm not necessarily the, necessarily the expert. I don't know if you, Leanne, wanted to talk a little bit about how Vesalius and other uh, uh, physicians, anatomists sourced source their bodies. Uh, Vesalius was very inspired by Galen. And of course, wow. Galen in, in Roman times was not allowed to dissect human bodies. So he had to dissect animal bodies. And he knew that this could be limiting. So in his own writing, he said, if you ever have access to human bodies, if you see them, if you see a dead body at the side of the road, if you see a body emerging from a graveyard, look at it, analyze it dissect it and correct my errors. And this is exactly what Vesalius did. So Vesalius is not like um, defying Galen. He's following Galen very closely. And when he does have access to human bodies, he finds out there were some errors and he corrects some of them. But the way he has access, it's a number of ways. And one way is through criminals, criminal bodies, um, some people who are publicly 
punished and publicly tortured and killed during the early modern period, their punishment continues after death by being anatomized. So they're opened up and the punishment of their body continues. Um, so Vesalius sometimes has access to these bodies. Uh, the other, and, and the Frenis piece that's quite well known has a female criminal body. That's very rare for women to be um, executed. And so he is well connected to have access to this body and to be able to dissect female bodies. The other way that bodies were accessed was through if you died um, without relatives in a town, in, in a foreign land, which could be anywhere outside of your hometown, then maybe if your body's not claimed quickly enough, you could be dissected. As dissections are becoming more popular, the bodies, there aren't enough bodies. And so sometimes Vesalius's followers were reputed to dig up freshly interred bodies. And so if you had a loved one during, say, the 16th century who had recently died, you'd might like to stay at the gravesite for a few days to make sure that someone's not going to come along and dig up the body. So there are a number of ways that these bodies were acquired. Um, people did not generally wish to be dissected or anatomized. They did not donate their bodies at the time. But I'll turn it back to you, Marnie. Okay, thanks, Leanne. Um, yeah, that was great. I think for me, Vesalius and his frontispiece of um, uh, of him dissecting the female cadaver was is important for me, um, especially since the the public dissection that one. There's like this vibrant crowd, and it's diverse. Um, there's a richly decorated anatomical theater. It's uh, it's almost sensational. And uh, it's specifically a female cadaver, knowing that that would be harder to find. Um, and with Vesalius simultaneously uh, demonstrating, lecturing uh, dissector. Um, and I think the iconography of legitimizing uh, dissection. Um, sort of portraying him as like an honorable scholar um, is interesting, especially, and so uh, so with Vesalius and, and his female cadavers, a lot of um, people studying under him were recording where, where the female cadavers came from, just because there aren't like so many of them. And so I do have a piece that's not here in, in the exhibition uh, where I try to like monumentalize and remember these anonymous women who were criminals or hung as a criminal or their um, execution was scheduled to coincide with Vesalius's demonstrations um, and sort of uh, monumentalizing an anonymous woman who was from a lower socioeconomic background and didn't have a say in what happened to her body after life, um, especially women in the sex trade and that sort of thing. Um, so that's sort of my interest for this. Um, I, do we wanna go on, go to the next piece, which sort of makes it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the female cadaver, um, we're looking at hmm, trying to find out the, what the secrets of women are or the, the secrets of the uterus. Um, so this is a this is a piece that Leanne has looked at, not me. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Sure. You know, we have um, a restrike of the Vesalius at the University of Alberta. So anyone who would like to see one version of Vesalius's, it's from the original woodcuts in the rare books collection here at the University of Alberta. You can see the Vesalius. I've seen the Vesalius copies like Marnie at different places. There's it was very popular in a way, right? Expensive, but disseminated. I saw this version of the Vesalius at the University of Virginia, uh, yeah, University of Virginia uh, in Charlottesville in their rare books collection. And it was so fascinating because it was donated by a surgeon, an American surgeon later on. But before that, it had been uh, within a monastery and they had this, the image of the female anatomy. I know to modern viewers, it looks like male anatomy, but female and maybe both as Marnie suggested, 
but the pudenda, like the shameful parts, the external parts were burned away as if they were too shameful to be displayed in the monastery. So I was quite fascinated by this um, historical memory of the response to the work. Um, and I did want to ask you about like response and the responses you would like vis viewers to have as my next question, but I'll just go back to you to see if you want to say anything else about Vesalius. Right. I mean, we could look at different copies um, at rare book libraries and, and notice um, all sorts of different things. And maybe maybe the general audience doesn't know that quite often anatomical uh, like genitalia would be covered with a flower or a wisp, a cloudy wisp of something um, just to to block the, that something you'd have to lift. And it was often um, blocked from the viewers on the on the front page. Yeah, uh, hmm. I, th I think it's important to talk about, well, so while I'm looking for evidence of females um, in publishing houses and printmaking, um, in dissection, um, and maybe I'm getting sidetracked a little bit, but my lungs piece that opens up is like a, sort of like a, do we have that? I'm getting sidetracked. <laughs> There. Yeah. Um, so it's just called lungs, but it's more of a like holy anatomy and more of a, an homage to um, early female uh, females who would um, uh, would ha who have dissected or had done um, uh, had done autopsies on bodies. Um, so it's meant to sort of be a, a religious a religious triptych that sort of uh, that you can open up and reveal um yeah i kind of wanted if we're going to talk about gender yeah so so thinking about so thinking about the presence of women so looking for women in in early modern dissection and anatomy and looking for women in the crowds looking for evidence of women in print houses um often females would uh you wouldn't hear any information about women working in print houses unless their husband had passed away and they had remarried another printmaker to help run the shop um so just looking at little little bits and instances of of, of evidence of women um and then thinking about gender uh, sex and gender um and looking for notions of like a one sex system or a two sex system and thinking about maybe uh even queering uh the uh queering flap anatomy and um the and who the audience is and who the viewer was in early uh early modern um anatomical descriptions of things um and how uh desire can come into play um with these early pieces mm -hmm. We can go back to Vesalius. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go on? To, we can go on to yeah. the next. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, I, I just, as an aside, I also looked for women involved in dissection, and it seems like midwives were present and also undertook certain autopsies. So autopsy is not the same as dissection, but if we think of opening yeah. the body and looking inside to learn about it, they can be linked. I just wondered, I wanted to know what you, what is the contempt, what you think is the contemporary value of returning to these historical images of the body? What do you hope that people who see the work here or come to the McMullen Gallery understand about their own bodies after um, visiting your show? Um, I can talk about sort of what I hope and maybe what I hope the viewers get, but for me, um, things like all of this work is really political for me. Um, even the act of even the act of being in the shop and manufacturing and fabricating on the CNC router is a political act. So um, there's still not a really heavy presence of females working in fabrication and uh, machining technology. Um, so just doing that is is performative and political for me. Um, looking back at 400 years of women's work, looking back at early forms of um, reproductive health, um, 
Uh, and, I, and I work towards adding my own personal uh, imagery and symbolism and things I found while doing my research um, is really important. And for still thinking about bodily autonomy, like part of it is bodily autonomy. Part of it is um, if, we, if we just look at early modern forms of opening it up and exposing women's bodies and how it's relevant to today's politics, um, is a, is a main, is, is a main theme in the work. Um, and I'm, I'm so, uh, some of the, even in the watercolors, they're just studies, but they do have, you know, abortion pills and early sanitary sponges and 28 day cycle measurement charts. And just looking at, um, early uh, or even early paper ephemera and advertising and just the way things were sold and advertised to women early on um, even like products like Lysol were um, Lysol douche and things like that um, early abortion pills uh, so a lot of I'm interested in reproductive health care um, but it's still all 100% relevant in 2022 you know um, so I think it's still important um, and I think we can still learn from the past. And I still think that we have a really, we have a long way to go. Uh, for the audience, that's completely different, right? And so, and I did spend some time in the gallery and I did see a lot of patients walking through the show um, and patients hooked up to, you know, wires and IV bags and um, that sort of thing. So I guess my question is, I, my question is how, how does a patient interpret the work or, um, or appreciate it or uh, gain some understanding um, from it? Uh, that, that is the question for sure. Um, the one that's showing right now, the, 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 the mouth wide open, uh, it's, a, it's an image that's been reproduced by um, over time, all the way up till like the 1800s and 1900s, um, lithographies and things like that. And it's just an open mouth. Um, but it, I did find that it had like red luscious lips, but also a mustache. Um, but also I really felt like this, I felt like this, this, it was screaming. So sometimes I, that's how I feel um, uh, uh, as a patient or, or as, a, um, as someone with a uterus, I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Do we do we want to talk a little bit about? Um, uh, I can talk a little bit about some of the the uh, the other materials I've used in the work. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So um, it's not just paper in wood. There are also a collection of speculums, um, which references. Um, uh, the speculum we're using today is very much the same speculum speculum we we've used for a really long time and uh the uh um the the physician who um invented it um was um in, in anesthesia was invented and he was doing gynecological experiments and wasn't using anesthesia like any kind of anesthetic um, on the on the women he was experimenting on. Um, other, I'm also inserting family and symbolic imagery into the work. So, so like the lung piece was created with, um, yeah, there it is, uh, crib bedding, like old crib mattress fabric um, that was hand dyed, but the, um, the pattern on it is like a quatrefoil, which is a religious icon. Um, which I find really interesting. And uh, I'm stenciling with um, stenciling patterns on with fishing lures and things that are meaningful to me. Um, the other piece that we haven't talked about at all, the little heart is an early um, uh, image that you would find in Rene, uh, in a, in a Rene Descartes medical illustration. And I have um, braided hospital gowns sort of coming, coming down the piece. Um, so, which is really personal to me, and I, and I don't know. I hope that maybe the maybe patients can I identify with or think about think about altered gowns or what a gown looks like or how we can possibly um, invent or change hospital gowns so that they are uh, more appropriate or don't feel as clinical um, and as scary to patients. 
things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Um, yeah, I, I just thought I would jump in with one little, because you were sort of asking about um, what the work might mean to to patients or other people in, in the hospital. And I think it's interesting, the response that we've received, because historically, um, it was sort of like, no, you, can't, you absolutely should not display body parts in, in a hospital uh, gallery setting. Like people are they're just not going to like it um and just the evidence that we have shows that that's not really the case and that's not how people respond when when they see work like this um i think generally and i think partially it is because of the interactivity and the material handling that you use but people see these works as um approachable and then also in a way um reflecting their own stories because they are, you know, experiencing some sort of medical trauma potentially. Um, and the same thing goes for staff in the hospital. Like the one funny comment that we had was, there, it, it was written like, two nephrologists complained that kidneys were underrepresented in the show. So um, <laughs> every, all of our different, um, all of our different stakeholders in this gallery have different ways of accessing like anatomical imagery and um yeah it's just it's just very cool to see that um would the both of you be open to taking a couple of audience questions since we have have some time sure, sure. yeah of course I, I think the best way if anyone has a question would be to throw it in the chat um so if anybody has a question feel free to throw it in the chat box um because I think everyone is muted right now, if that's. Um, you might be able to unmute yourself, but yeah, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. So more kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we have we have specialists in every area here, right? So people <laughs> people just want to see themselves represented. Um, oh. <clears throat> Did you have a question, Alan, that you wanted to ask? I think you might be able to unmute. Thank you. I needed you to unmute me. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to build on on Tyler's comment and and add a question at the end. Um, so I also work in McMullen Gallery and have observed the patients um, interacting with the artwork and 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 visitors as well and, and physicians. And um, as Tyler described, there is this enormous um, kind of response, like people are really interested in the materiality of it by coming into the gallery and really wanting to go up close and understand the material, how you made it. Um, there's a lot of questions about that as well. Um, and then just uh, an obvious comfort versus what we've experienced in the past discomfort with seeing um, images of the body. We've we've had some really strong responses in the past, <clears throat> negative responses, I would say. And so over the last eight years since I worked at the hospital, that that's changed a lot. And I'm curious, um, maybe from your perspective and your work, if you've noticed a change, um, whether it's sort of um, your your work is very honest and direct there's a personal element to it um is there something culturally that's shifted over the last decade or perhaps longer in your view that has sort of opened up a space for your work um to be um accessed and sort of appreciated in a different way if there's any comments on that and leanne perhaps as well if you want to comment on that as well Um, say I, I just had my 23rd rebirth day two weeks ago. Um, and it was definitely a lot more raw and emotional for me to make work 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you know, 15 years ago. Um, I'm more comfortable with making work that's loosely, att like loosely att attached to, um, the possibility of death. <clears throat> I think uh, Western society is still afraid to talk about death um, and illness and trauma and things like that. Um, I think I was really nervous about putting the work up during COVID um, 
but I was relieved to see a positive response in, in viewers. Um, I'm not sure what has changed, but um, it might also just aesthetically, the, the palette isn't an intimidating for one, right? It's not an intimidating palette. And there's some um, celebratory like gold spray paint inserted in a in a couple of different areas so i think it is a little bit um it's it's a bit fun in some area it, you know just with the sim simply the palette and i and i've made darker work and um so some of for me some of it looks like cotton candy or nail polish or um the lungs piece i was so attracted to when i was at duke because so there's this remlin um piece that you open up and you pull all of the organs out and the lungs, it just looks like these beautiful braids, like hair braids. And it's just like, um, not scary, right? I don't know. Um, I know that people become really nervous when they get up close to, can become really nervous when they get really close to the, um, the etchings and they see the coat hangers um, and they question that. Um, and, and that can be a point of um, making, making folks uncomfortable. But I think it's really important because uh, women in Canada still don't have equal, uh, people with uterus uh, still don't have equal access to healthcare in, in every province. So um, I think that's, even though the coat hanger, the notion of the coat hanger is overused, um, a really overused symbol, um, I, I think it's still important to think about. And I think maybe not even, not everyone is, in, is aware that um, everyone doesn't have equal access. Um, Leanne? I was really drawn to the work when I was, I was at the hospital for a different reason, um, but I saw the work, I was very drawn to it, the palette, but also the tactility. So I think it's really appealing. Um, and then people can engage with different aspects of it. So I think your work manages to, to be complex enough that it can um, address different audiences and have that appeal, especially the lungs one. Um, I would speak more like the body. I work on the early modern body and I teach the history of anatomical dissection, the history of childbirth and all of these things. And students are fascinated by it and, and continually want more. And when I add it to my um, courses on visual culture, that's what gets the most response. So students are quite fascinated by it. I teach also at Wings, the um, women's shelter. One of the, it's a second stage women's shelter here in Edmonton. And consistently the women ask me to talk about childbirth and the history of childbirth. And they're just fascinated by it. I think because it's something people can relate to physically, um, you know, they, you, there's some connection there. And then there's such a difference, right? The early modern notions of the body, like the idea that, there is only one sex and that with, that the female body is kind of a derivative of the male body is really fascinating. It helps people to understand the body as a historical construction. And maybe there's more willingness to think about the body as this historically changing and transforming entity. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great. Um, <clears throat> we would have time for one more audience question if if anybody feels so compelled um nicole um, i think you might be able to unmute yourself now too hi um my one of my collaborators and i um are just sitting and watching and uh we're loving the presentation and and we do um similar work on a lot of embodiment type practices um and i guess i just wondered if you could maybe speak to um any of the ways that you sort of find anchors or guiding principles or things to just sort of find um, like a cohesiveness because one of the things that sometimes we come up against is just there's so much and you can go in so many directions and it can become diffuse really easily so just how you go about making choices in, in your work as an artist yeah that's always a problem I have this huge endless list of things I want to do and I sort of attack them uh, in a sort of probably I, there's a lot that I, I get I go off on a tangent and realize it doesn't fit um, I have to, I do narrow it down and highlight things. I have to revert to old ideas and, and I have a really hard time containing myself, uh, in that way. So, uh, I hear you definitely. 
Um, I do feel like all of this somehow fits together. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know if I can answer your question. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. The idea of sort of going back to things that come up again and again. And um, yeah, and, yeah, and even just to see how you put all these different threads together to, to weave a narrative. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and I often, it's always what I didn't think I was going to do. Like I'll go, I'll have a focus in a direction and it's always something else that happens. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Read on, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> you also said at one point that you let the technology guide you sometimes too. Is that part of like some of the decisions it makes for you might steer you in another direction? Yeah, so, so I found a way of working that works for me. I'm carving, I have a certain carving bit that I use. It's slow, um, but it carves the way I want it to. Uh, it looks topographical. It almost looks like hoodoos. I always carve halfway through three quarter inch plywood. The crappiest, cheapest plywood I can get um, is important to me. Um, it chips and it sometimes stutters. And if you're, when you're learning about speeds and feeds and machining, um, I'm constantly trying to run the machine faster than it runs. Um, but I found a process that works for me and I'm aesthetically interested in, and I'm sort of going with that. But if you do, like sometimes, um, sometimes when I pause the machine or if I've input something a little bit incorrectly, it, um, I've had occasions where the machine has just like plowed right through the work after like an eight hour carve. And I just go with it, right? And okay, I'm just gonna like patch it with, like I have wood wood patch and I'll just try, try to patch a hole like this big. And, and, and like, I don't want it to be pristine and precise. Like I don't need to spend um, hours and hours and hours poly, car, uh, sanding the edges. And it's like, it's not about that. Um, it's still kind of raw. And um, it's not how I would hand carve things, but yeah, there's definitely this push and pull between myself and the machine. Not that it's an it's an exceptional exceptional machine, um, but we it's older and we do sometimes run into error, and it's usually operator error or um, me trying to force the machine to do something it doesn't want to do. Yeah. Looks like we have another question from Chelsea. Chelsea, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, sorry, I know you had said it was the last question, but uh, thank you for letting me speak this in. Um, hi, Leanne. Hi, Marnie. Um, I just wanted to talk, like, I'm so happy with Tyler's question, because my question was around this idea of fabrication and your relationship with the machine, because to me, it's so strongly like a crip aesthetic, right? Allowing this embodied technology to kind of be in dialogue and to let your body rest while it does these acts of labor. And I wonder if you could expand a little bit more about like the relationship building that you have almost with this idea of fabrication or the machine. Cause I know working with the laser, I call it my laser and I genuinely have like a bond almost with that very specific piece of equipment. Um, and I was just curious if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, so my techno, it's, a t it's not mine, as I call it. Um, so I teach at Red Deer Polytechnic and in the Center for Innovation and Technology is the techno CNC router. Um, I call her Ruby Soho um, and I call her my robot and she's not a robot, she's a machine, like she's not a robot. Yeah. But, you know, I know her quirks. I used to have to phone techno, you know, what's happening? Um, but I know all of her quirks and I know Mm -hmm. Oh, how long she takes, right? I know how long she takes to do a certain job and I know what not, what she doesn't like to do and what she does like to do. And yeah, so I do have this really like tight, intimate bond with my machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And I don't know what I would have, you know, and I, and I, and I think about what would I do if I didn't have this machine. And I know that I'm in a, a position of privilege that I have access to this machine. Mm -hmm. And right. And, and I think another important thing was um, a woman trained me to use it. Her name's Hi it was, uh, Heidi Mayer um, trained me to use it. And I think it was like really special that we, that I learned how mm -hmm. to use the machine with her um, and sort of like passing that knowledge on to me. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but yes, um, the machine. You the did. Machine, yeah. It feels yeah. like a kinship network in a really interesting way. Um, 
And yeah. I should acknowledge it's not my laser either, but oh boy, I love little Speedy. What a dream, what a dream. Thank you for yeah. chatting with me, Marnie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and she allows me to multitask. <laughs> Absolutely. So many yeah. papers have been written in that room. Yeah. Yeah, oh, which, which does lead me to, so as a printmaker, um, uh, uh, print, uh, as a printmaker, we question, like why would you have a machine do the work for you that could be like um like it's often a fad or um i'll try this technology but it's not really printmaking anymore mm -hmm. it, you know there's there's also so there's it, i understand that there's so much importance um being put on the handmade um yeah. and I, I just my robot does the work yeah also that argument is so ableist so like blessed for making these fights for having different technology and printmaking studios. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, well, that probably feels like a, a great place for us to wrap up. Um, thanks for the, the great questions, everybody. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of great discussions about history and also kind of like our relationships with ourselves and, and with machines that become our friends. Um, so um, firstly, just thank you to um, Marnie, you've been uh, an incredible artist to work with during this exhibition and um, for, for spending your time with us today. And also to Leanne for uh, bringing your knowledge and, and expertise to, to this conversation. Um, I think I speak on behalf of everyone uh, saying that this was very enlightening and, and a nice way to, to spend the lunch hour learning about um, your work and, and early modern medical history. Um, there's been a few comments, um, so we will be, uh, we have recorded the session and we, we, we will be posting the video of the session to our website um, probably within the next week or so. So um, some people were looking forward to um, either looking at it again or who couldn't make it, um, it will be there. Um, yeah, we are, yeah, just very grateful that you have all spent some time with us today and um, I hope you all have a great, uh, great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Ellen. And thanks, thanks everyone Marnie. for coming. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.